I always knew that one day the fire could come, but I don't think emotionally I was prepared for the fire that did come through here and how devastating it was. I don't think you could be prepared for losing absolutely everything that means anything in to you. Life for Amanda heffernan Bucken is again taking shape after bushfires decimated her 150-acre farm in southern New South Wales last summer. The fire wiped out poles and wires connecting the property to the energy grid and Amanda and her daughter, Sreza Heffernan, were forced to abandon their homes. If we were to be in a position where we had to fight the fire, we had to have power to make the water go. When it came down to it, we didn't have either of those things. We were at the end of a very long drought and that we had very limited water. And then the power was, just wasn't there. My daughter, Shresa, insisted, well, you're not staying because <laughs> at that stage, it was just unbelievable, the heat in the air. Soon after the fires, the electricity network company, Essential Energy, made an unexpected offer to build a standalone power system big enough to service the farm. It meant the network could avoid rebuilding about four kilometres of burnt out power lines, as electricity executive Luke Jenner explains. A standalone power system is basically consists of an array of solar panels, a battery and a diesel generator and allows us to supply power to our customers um, without them actually being physically connected to the poles and wires network. A typical standalone power system has a 10 kilowatt solar system, a 30 kilowatt battery and a 10 kilowatt diesel generator that kicks in when the battery runs low and the panels aren't producing energy. It replaces poles and wires, which can pose a bushfire risk and are expensive to maintain, a cost that makes up about half the expense of power bills for everyone on the network. We had over 3,200 poles destroyed across the state. It provided the opportunity to go and put those standalone power systems in and get those customers back on supply more quickly. To put the 3,200 poles into context, um, the previous bushfire event that we've ever dealt with was approximately 400 poles. So for us the main benefit has comes back to the reliability in a situation where the rest of the lines have gone down or there's been a power outage further down the line. What's happened over time is that the cost of those standalone power supply system components has come down. The cost of building the grid hasn't come down. It's a pretty new thing for networks to, to get into. This is absolutely about trying to get ahead of that curve and build in resilience for, for storms, for bushfires, for floods, for all these events that unfortunately will become more frequent. Claire Savage is Australia's energy regulator. She's now balancing the interests to make this big change work, from those who want them to the networks and government. She's receiving a growing number of applications from networks to build standalone power systems. We're starting to see a trickle become a little bit more of a flow, so it's not yet a huge demand for them. And part of that's because the draft legislation hasn't been enacted. So there isn't a great deal of incentive for the distribution companies to do it. They're currently doing it more as pilots and trials. The bushfires exposed the vulnerabilities of power networks in bushfire prone areas. But consumer advocates say outdated legislation and industry rules are hampering progress. The rules are based on an outdated way of thinking about how systems operate. And they are that you've got a monopoly business that can only provide a monopoly service and contestable businesses that provide retail and generation services. New rules need to be introduced to allow the network business to do all of those things. Commonwealth and state energy ministers have actually drafted new legislation in this space um, and that new legislation would actually solve a lot of the problems. It would enable the distribution companies to actually be able to recover revenues from a standalone power system. 
The other thing it does though is to provide consumers with the same protections and we're working on our own guidelines um, in anticipation of the changes to make sure that we can get this stuff going as quickly as possible once the laws are in place. The country watched as the coastal Victorian town of Mallacoota was torched by last summer's bushfires. And behind me is Mallacoota. There were 123 houses lost in town and around the same number, maybe some fewer um, sheds and workshops and garages on private properties. Every one of those that had power had to be disconnected from their, the power grid before that section of town could come back onto the grid. From about 200 and some kilometres down from here, it turns into a single wire and uh, makes its way through the bush to Malakuta. In the days after the disaster, local renewable energy advocate Tricia Hiley saw an opportunity and wrote to the local network imploring it to rethink the town's energy source. A lot of poles and wires, the expensive part of getting the electricity here, uh, were gone. And I wanted to make sure that Osnet services had in its thinking the potential for us being an off-the-grid microgrid. We've got a number of containers. It's taken almost a decade of community lobbying for a more reliable power supply. Now, after two years of development, electricity network Osnet Services is about to connect a large battery system and generator that will back up the main line to provide a continuous supply during unexpected interruptions. They're a really informed community who really understands what they need and um, we're really grateful for that. And we think that's the model more and more as well as the sort of cost of technology coming down. There's a real appetite for communities to kind of take control of their own power supply and really engage. Dr Hiley sees the next goal as Malakuta going off the grid entirely and being powered by renewable energy. Now it's really, really good because it gives us a platform to put the solar in. But the energy regulator warns the technology still has limitations. The technology is changing rapidly, which is terrific, but we're still subject and vulnerable to days without sun or wind. And in that case, you'd be reliant on battery storage and cost-effective battery storage at the moment is still sort of four hour batteries, um, maybe six to eight hours in, in the next few years. For the time being, you need something like a diesel generator with some rotating generation in it um, to actually help the local protection system. So until we get that resolved, uh, there won't be sort of standalone just solar and battery. Back in Yorubadella, Sreza Heffernan and her mother hope the trial will become permanent. They're yet to receive a power bill, but already Sreza is sure it's the future. I'd like to see more people able to access it. As an option, if you want to access the same reliability of poles and wires, but you're at the end of a long, unwired area, you want to be able to do that with less cost and also less impact on the environment. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.